Thank you for watching Friendship Community Church Sermons on Demand. We're pleased you have decided to view our pulpit messages. Our Sermons on Demand are a ministry of Friendship Community Church and are provided as a resource to anyone who desires to study the Word of God. So open your Bible and get ready to dig into the Word of God and see what God has for you today. We are back in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 this morning. And if you remember the past week, we went through the first 14 verses of chapter 9 dealing with Paul's arguments concerning his support in pay. I, I told you last week it was, it appeared self-serving of me and I did not intend it to be that way. Um, I'm preaching what God wrote in the text and, and so sometimes that's the way it works. During uh, last week we saw that, uh, that Paul gave six points in those 14 verses of why it was right why he had the right to pay. Okay? Those where Paul was an apostle, it was customary to pay workers. Even today, it's sort of customary to pay workers. It's according to God's law. Others exercise the right. In other words, other apostles and elders exercise the right. It's a universal pattern. <coughs> we saw that Jesus had ordained it. Because of the context of why Paul was making these arguments, we, gotta, we have to remember the whole context here. I tell you guys that all the time. I, I want you to remember the context. Because you can't take a verse out of the context and have it mean what God means. You know, uh, I, I've told you several times, I don't care what a verse means to you. Um, back in the 70s, we had the Bible, uh, uh, Bible study movement take off, and everybody was having Bible studies in their home, and, and uh, people would sit around on the floor and, and, and discuss things. Um, they would pull out a, a passage, and they'd say, well, I think that means to me. Well, I don't care what it means to you. I, I care what God means when he wrote it. That's what's important. The Bible is not something that is... You know, we, we have this phrase going around that it's a living, breathing document, like the Constitution, and it can mean different things to different people. That's nonsense. God intended a meaning of it when he wrote it. And he intended to convey something from it. The author determines what a word means. The recipient doesn't. Can you imagine a, word, a world where the recipient gets to determine what a word means? I use this illustration in my dissertation. You go to a restaurant, and you sit down, you have this beautiful steak, baked potato, loaded, loaded of course, and your bill comes, it's $56.60. If you live in a world where you get to determine what the words mean as the recipient, as the reader of the world, word, you can say, that fifty-six sixty really means zero. See ya. I'm done. Now, it doesn't work that way, does it? When the restaurant puts down 5660 on the on the menu, it means 5660. It doesn't mean 22, it doesn't mean 0. But see, we have this feeling that we can determine what God means. Now, God determined what he meant. Our job is to figure it out and to get it right. And that's why I put so much emphasis on context. Because when we're taking sections of Scripture out of their context, the theme of the pro part of uh, Scripture that, that we're reading, when we take it out of that section, we can make it say just about whatever you want. I was watching a, a video on, uh, from Dr. John MacArthur this past week where he was talking about this. And he said, you know, you can make the Bible say whatever you want just by looking for random verses. You know, the one verse where it talks about, and this was his illustration where it talks about, you know, going out and hanging himself and committing suicide. Talking about Judas. Then I can flip over to another verse that says, go, out, go thou do likewise. 
Should we do that? I mean, is that the way to interpret the passage of Scripture? Take one verse, hang yourself, do it quickly, do it now, and do like Judas did. Does that make sense to anybody? But that's what a lot of people are doing as we, as we take, as we interpret Scripture. So I'm, I'm always harping on context. Don't take a verse out of context. And if you have a, if you have a biblical principle that you want to understand, defend, or to, to have us understand, defend it from Scripture, not from your emotions. Um, framework. There are a lot of things I'm emotional about that I can't defend from Scripture. But things that I can defend from Scripture, I will go to the mat for. So I want you to understand the context. That's it's important. The broader context of what Paul is talking about. You know, we saw last week he was talking about he should get paid. But what was the broader context? The broader context is Christian liberty. What we looked at last week, he was setting up the discussion this week of why he doesn't get paid because of his Christian liberty. So that he doesn't harm the proclamation of the word of God. So that he doesn't harm the development of others, of other believers. As Christians, there are many things that are lawful for us to do. There's many things that are moral and acceptable for us to do that aren't right for us to do. Because it might harm our testimony or might harm someone else's development. And that's the overall context of this section that we're looking at. We have to be mindful of the, the weaker Christians around us. The ones that aren't yet fully understanding of what liberty means. Paul is utilizing his financial support as a true illustration of this point. He's making the point that he doesn't do some things because they might hurt someone else, even though, as we can see, those are perfectly acceptable reasons why he should be getting paid. But he chose not to, so he wouldn't hamper the gospel. Paul was giving up the right in order to not be a burden on the church in Corinth than anyone from le legitimately saying that he was profiting from the gospel. Your battery's dying. Can I have a new battery, please? How's that? That better? A lot better. A lot better? Okay. So let's, uh, let's take a look at, uh, at Paul's rationale here. We've already read the text, but we're going we're gonna to read some of it again. He wanted to not lose his reward as well. He wanted to, to be a good witness and a good testimony so that he would lose his reward. Look at the text again. But I've not used any of these rights, these rights that he, he enumerated in the beginning of the, uh, the chapter. And I'm not writing these things so that someone will be, something will be done for him. He's not writing to them saying, look, take up a big collection and send me some money. Or he wasn't praying, please Lord, may I have a Mercedes Benz or a G5. I saw Joel Olstein on, uh, on Fox News this week. I wanted to climb through the TV and just smack his head. It would have hurt, but that's okay. And I'm not writing these things so that someone will be done for me. In fact, it would be better for me to die than no one will deprive me uh, of my reason for boasting. For if I preach the gospel, I have no reason for boasting because I'm compelled to do this. I can't do anything but this. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do not do this voluntarily, I will have a reward. But if I do it unwillingly, I'm entrusted with a responsibility. What then is my reward? That when I preach the gospel, I may offer the gospel free of charge and 
so not make full use of my rights in the gospel. I love the way Paul writes sometimes. He restates his principle here in the, in the middle of his illustration and then continues on with the illustration. Paul says that he doesn't seek pay for his ministry from the Corinthians because he doesn't want to lose his reward for preaching the gospel. He didn't want to lose the potential of hearing from, from the Father, well done, good and faithful servant. He also didn't want anything to get in the way of unbelievers from coming to know Christ. He didn't want there to be a, a legitimate charge of you're preaching the gospel so they'll give you a G5. He didn't want that. G5 is an air, a really nice airplane. Goes really fast. Jet airplane. I hear everything. Well, almost everything. So when Linda's talking. He did not want the potential of someone seeing his ministry. As, she was going to say it, so I just had to get it out there. He didn't want anybody to see him as being the guy that was out there preaching so that he got money. God will bless you if you send in another $25 kind of preacher. As they go home to eat dirt, and he goes home to his 18,000 square foot mansion. And if you don't believe there are preachers out there like that, you're not watching enough TV. He didn't want the potential of someone seeing his ministry as about him. If there is any characteristic that you need to know about the Apostle Paul, is that he was humble and he was loyal to God. And he didn't want any of the attention on him, he wanted it on God. And so he was willing to dispense with any kind of income from the Corinthians. Paul emphasizes he wasn't writing this in an attempt to solicit support. He was illustrating his principle of love tempering Christian liberty. This was not Paul using reverse psychology to convince them he wanted to, no, really, I don't want you to pay me. I don't want you to pay. It wasn't Paul doing that. You know, we, we know of those kinds of things happening, but that's not what was going on. But Paul didn't tell this just to the Corinthians. Look what he said in First or in, in First Thessalonians. For you recall, brothers and sisters, our toil and drudgery by working night and day, so as not to impose a burden on any of you. We preach to you the gospel of God. Can you imagine what it was like to be a tent maker around the Mediterranean? We're not talking about nylon tents. We're talking about weaving camel hair and leather and stuff like that. Can you imagine sitting on the street corner, sewing these and, and manufacturing these tents with all that hot material all over you, with the leather that had to be worked, and doing that all day long in the sun so that you could preach the gospel in the evening and on the weekends. Can you imagine that? Working all day long and then working all night long. He said, you recall, brothers and sisters, our toil and drudgery? And then in 2 Thessalonians, he says, And we did not eat anyone's food without paying. Instead, in toil and drudgery, we worked night and day in order to not be a burden on you. We didn't even allow you to feed us for nothing. Paul said, I'm not a burden. We do know, despite the protest from Paul, that the Thessalonians supported Paul after he left to Thessalonica. He was one of their missionaries and they sent him funds to assist him. But he took nothing from them while he was there. Now jump back to verse 15 of 1 Corinthians chapter 9. But I've not used any of these rights and I'm not writing these things so that someone, something will be done for me. In fact, it would be better for me to die than no one will deprive me of my reason for boasting. At first read, it seems like Paul is proud in boasting, doesn't it? I'm really proud of the fact that I don't get money from you. That wasn't what Paul was saying. He says he would rather be dead than give anyone the potential of saying he was in it for the money. He would rather be dead than have, give someone the legitimate ability to say that he was in it for the money. He was in it for the glory of God, not for the glory of Paul. 
If Paul was in it for himself, he could have remained a Pharisee, remained a member of the, Sag of the, of the uh, Sanhedrin. He could have remained a big wig in Israel. But he chose to get beaten, shipwrecked, and left for dead and stoned, rather, for the glory of God. He was a big deal in Israel. You know, we, we lose that perspective of who Paul was. He was a member of the strictest sect in Israel, the Pharisees. He was also, I believe, a member of the Sanhedrin, the ruling body as a young man. That's odd. We get the term elder from the, from the concept that the leadership was older. But as a young man, he consented to the death of Stephen. And I think that's an indication that he was part of the ruling council. He was appointed by the high priest to eliminate the scourge of the church. He was a big deal in Israel. I think... You know, this is rich reading in the white spaces. I think if Paul hadn't become a Christian, it would have been the school of, of Paul or Saul, just like we know of the school of Hillel and the school of Gamaliel. He would have been that big a deal. Today we would be writing the writings of Paul or Saul as a Jewish historian, philosopher, rabbi, instead of Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ. That's how big a deal he was. It's a pretty serious statement that Paul made. I'd rather be dead than someone legitimately charge me with something that could have been possible. That's pretty serious. There are many guys that do preach the gospel for financial gain, unfortunately, in our world. Who have become millionaires because they preach in church. I suppose there are some that preach the gospel message and have good theology that are leading very large congregations and get paid very well. But when I did a little short survey of... of the theology of the guys that are making gazillions of dollars preaching the gospel, I'm not real impressed with theology. I'm not saying that, that in order to have good theology, you've got to be poor. I'm just saying that I don't see a lot of good theology in the guys that make gazillions of dollars preaching the gospel. It frustrates me when I see preachers rolling up in brand new Mercedes to their congregation and the little old lady in the congregation given the last dollar she has and having nothing to eat the rest of the week when he goes home to his servants. That frustrates me. The preacher really ought to reflect the congregation he serves. We've all seen those situations, but... Paul didn't want to be in that situation. He didn't want to drive up in his Mercedes chariot while everybody else was walking with holes in their sandals. His reward was pleasing the Lord. His reward was making sure God was glorified, not himself. It wasn't about himself. It was about God. Always with Paul, it was about God. And you know what? Even when he was still a Pharisee and he was seeking out the church, it was about God. Because they were blaspheming by his standards, by the standards the Pharisees had taught, Paul was doing the right thing. They were blaspheming their God. Paul always had a bent to serve God. The word in our text this morning, boast, is the Greek word um, kauchima. Carries the idea of glorying or rejoicing. It's interesting that many of our English translations translate the word as boast. When boast is a minor secondary meaning, it's not the predominant meaning of the word. So I'm not really sure why our translators have gone with that vein, because I think it's a distortion of the text. Let me show you a verse where the same word is used but translated differently. 
But Christ is faithful as a son over God's house. We are of his house. In fact, we hold a family to our confidence and the hope we take pride in. Take pride in is the same word as boast. Paul had pride in his service of God. I do too. I am very proud of the fact that I serve God. Not in me, in God. I am proud to be his child and to be working for him. Not an arrogant pride, but I know who my Redeemer is and what he's capable of and what he does. Paul rejoiced in serving God and in giving God the glory for the work done. Paul didn't have the missionary efforts of Paul the Apostle. I hate it when, when guys' names are on their ministries. I can only think of a few exceptions where that is a legitimate thing. Because the focus then gets on that guy rather than on God. You know, if we're ever in a place where we build a building and we have a sign out front, my name's not on the sign because it's not about me. It's about God. I read an article this week where the guy was talking about who should be the senior pastor of every church. It's a fascinating article. Jesus Christ should be the senior pastor. If we were building a building and putting a sign out there, I'd say, Jesus Christ, senior pastor. I'm his under-shepherd. That's giving glory to God where it should be. And that's the way Paul lived his life. For Paul, it was always God and what he does through Paul. It was not what Paul does to make God proud. It's what God does through Paul. Back in chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians, Paul says, So that it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. I'm happy to serve God. We all should be happy to serve God. He told the Romans in Romans 15, So I boast in Christ Jesus about the things that pertain to God. He rejoiced in the gospel of Jesus Christ, the glory of the cross. Now back in chapter 9 of 1 Corinthians. For if I preach the gospel, I have no reason for boasting because I'm compelled to do this. Woe to me if I don't preach the gospel. Paul wasn't boasting in himself. He had nothing to boast of. He was a servant. He was a tool for God. He was compelled to preach. He was God, he's God's slave. He had no choice but to preach. Probably everybody in their first year of seminary has a seminary professor that tells them, look, if you can do anything other than preach the gospel, do that. If you can do anything other than be a pastor, be that. Because if you're going to be a real pastor, you have to be so committed that you can't do anything else. That's the principle that they're trying to get us to understand. Paul says he was compelled to do that. That's the Greek word epikatai, which literally, literally means to lie upon, or be on, press on, or be imposed on. It's a word that comes from the idea of, of taking a slug of, of metal and putting it in the press and making it a coin and putting an image on it to impose that image on it. God had imposed upon Paul the image of being a preacher of the gospel. He was compelled to do that. Paul was then placed under pressure to take the image of the Lord Jesus Christ in preaching the gospel. He couldn't get away from it anymore. He had to do it. Think about Paul on the road to Damascus. He's on his way to Damascus with warrants in his hand from the high priest and from the Sanhedrin. Go ahead and arrest the God. They are preaching blasphemy. And then on the road to Damascus, he fell on his knees when his bright light hit him. He said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Well, who are you? I'm the Lord Jesus Christ, the one that you're persecuting. He came face to face with the risen Jesus and came to realize it wasn't blasphemy. 
And his entire outlook on the world changed. He went into Damascus for three days. And then he went into the Arabian desert for three years. And I believe during those three years, he got what the other apostles got the first time around. He got his seminary education from the Lord Jesus Christ in the deserts of Arabia. We might even be able to make a case that he went down to Mount Sinai where the law was originally written. Now think about the dynamics of that. The Apostle Paul, who used to be a member of the Sanhedrin, who used to be a Pharisee, who was all about the keeping of the law, introduced to Jesus Christ and goes down to Mount Sinai where the law was given and was trained. Here it is. Here's the fulfillment of the law. Here's what we really should be living like. What a picture that is. Paul would later say to the Galatians, but when the one who set me apart from birth called me by his grace was pleased. Paul was dedicated to serving God from the time he was born. And I think you can make that statement say from before he was born. God had his eye on Paul, like he does all of us, had selected him to be a preacher of the gospel when Paul was a baby Pharisee, growing up in a Pharisee's house, then going to school at the feet of Gamaliel, the greatest rabbi of the day. Now, that was a pretty select place for Paul to get his education. Because the greatest rabbi of the day didn't run a school for a thousand boys. That's not how they had their, their schools by those great rabbis. The rabbi typically would take two or three, maybe four guys, and would mentor them, and teach them, and apprentice them. So he lived at the feet of Gamaliel. To, be, to learn the Old Testament. To learn the law of God. And then in the Arabian desert, at the feet of Jesus, to learn what it really means. God had him chosen from before he was born. He was compelled, pressed upon, to preach from the day he was born. Those of you reading through the Bible together just began reading Jeremiah. Probably the next book we'll do on Sunday mornings after we're done with 1st and 2nd Corinthians. Jeremiah said, Before I formed you in the mother's womb, I chose you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you to be a prophet to the nations. God chose Jeremiah before he was born. Now, if God did that for Paul, and God did that for Jeremiah, do you suppose it's any different for us? He called us to be his before we were born. Jeremiah understood what Paul understood. The sovereign God called him very early to be his servant. They could do nothing other but serve and preach. Dr. MacArthur in his commentary on 1 Corinthians adds this story con uh, concerning compulsion. Ramon Lull, the Spanish mystic and theologian, lived a careless and luxurious life for many years. He wrote that in a vision one night, Christ came to him carrying a cross and said, Carry the cross for me, Ramon. He pushed Christ away and refused. In her later vision, the same thing happened. Christ offered the cross and Ramon refused it. In a third vision, Christ laid the cross on, on the man's arms and walked away. What else could I do, Ramon explained, but take it up. Lull was a Franciscan monk in the 13th century of Majorca. What else could I do except take up the cross of Christ? Same was true for Jeremiah. Same was true for Paul. They could do nothing other than serve Jesus Christ. He didn't do it for pay. It wasn't for the big paycheck. It wasn't for the Mercedes chariot he could get. It was to please his slave master, God the Father. I understand the compulsion and the sense of responsibility 
to serve God and to preach. I felt the call very early in my saved life. I was probably 11 or 12. I was 11 when I was saved, and I was convinced to go into the ministry probably when I was 11 or 12. And so after high school, I, I headed off to our college in Indiana, and I, had, I was going to go great guns. I had it all planned out. I was going to do four years of college, three years of seminary, find a great church and be the pastor of the church. That's just the way things worked then. Then I sat down in Greek class with Weston Fields. <laughs> Weston's a great guy and we're friends, but I'm telling you what. My plans and God's plans were different plans. I didn't get the message God had sent. Because I, I flunked Greek. Now, let me tell you. When you don't have to work real hard in high school and you go to a, a really hard course like Grace or uh, Greek at Grace with Weston Field, this guy now has two earned doctorates and he, and he runs the Dead Sea Scroll Society, okay? He's way smarter than I'll ever be. And he was working on his first doctorate at the time, so he had to prove to us he was smart. I didn't do so good. So I was on the dean's list for the rest of my time at Grace. The problem is that was the list by the dean that said, get your grades up or you're out. The only semester I wasn't on that list was my first. It's because they didn't know me yet. So it didn't take long for me to figure out this isn't going to work. My four years of going to college and three years of seminary, that wasn't going to work. So I fell back on my second love, and that was public safety. I'd been a volunteer fireman down here. I'd become an EMT down here. And... A new EMS was starting there in Indiana, and I got involved with that, working full-time. And after a while, I dropped out of school. We got married, and things were going great guns for us. Except in northern Indiana in the early 80s, you couldn't make any money. You had to work like 19 jobs in order to pay your bills, kind of like it is in the economy today. Yep. So we had to make a decision, and we decided we were going to move somewhere close to family. Ohio or Florida? That's not a hard decision. So we packed up our bags and moved to Florida. I had a great job, or got a great job with the sheriff's office. I couldn't get an advancing job in Indiana because there just weren't that many. But here I got a great job, and I'm, I progressed through the ranks. I was having a great time. But the real story is how God shaped me for ministry. God never let me off the hook for that call that I felt when I broke my neck in sixth grade. And my Uncle Bernie came to visit me. I knew right then, there, I was going to go into the ministry. But I had to take some detours along the way. We'd been back in Fort Myers probably less than a year when I got involved in, in leadership at the Grace Brethren Church on Crystal Drive. My first post was Sunday School Superintendent. We still had an official board then, and and it was my job to fill the Sunday school classes and make sure they were doing what they needed to do and so forth. Then we got a new pastor and he moved the congregation into biblical eldership. And I became one of the elders. Chuck did as well. These moves were awakening in me the call that I knew I'd had several years before. Moving me toward ministry. And Randy saw that in me as well and pushed me to that. I was back in college. 14 years for a bachelor's degree. It's pretty good, huh? Then I continued on and got my, my master's. And I had already taken my uh, licensure exam in the district. And I was now accepted by the men as a, as a licensed elder in the fellowship. I don't tell you all that to say, look what I've accomplished. I say that to look what God did despite me. Despite my running away, I flagged that course in Greek and I ran as fast as I could from going into the ministry. And God didn't give up. He just had to smack me around a little bit. And after I got licensed, we looked for a church. We actively looked for a number of years. And God said, don't do that. Just trust me. That was hard. We were convinced we were going to a church somewhere. And God said, just stick it out here. Let me take care of you. 
Let me have you work enough years that you have a good retirement so you can work at any church. See, I'm like Paul. I didn't need to have the income here because God had provided me one. I don't say that to see, look what I've done. I say, look what God has done. As I was actively running, he would put obstacles in my way. And he'd drag me back. I mean, he puts an obnoxious preacher like Randy Smith in my way to make me focus on God. I was happy not focusing on God. But he put Randy in my way to force me to focus on God. To go back to where God had called me to be. Now I have the privilege of serving him as this, of the pastor of this wonderful church. There is not a day that goes by that I am not thrilled to be the pastor of this church. To be thrilled to see the development of you. Butch teaching this morning, that was so much of an excitement for me because of where he's come from. And there are a lot of you that are like that, that are growing. I have the privilege of serving as the chairman and secretary of the Florida District of Churches for the Grace Brethren Fellowship. I get to lead the men of this district. That's a thrill to me. Probably not for them, but it is for me. I sit on a, on a, on a committee of about eight guys for the National Fellowship as we put together our social concerns. What should we be focused on socially? in our fellowship. That's a thrill to me. God did that despite where I was going. Look what Paul says. He wants to win the loss to Christ. That's the message of what Paul is talking about. Look at these verses here. For since I am free from all, I can make myself a slave to all in order to gain even more people. To the Jews I became like a Jew to gain the Jews. To those under the law I became like one under the law. Though I myself am not under the law to gain those under the law. To those free from the law I became like one free from the law. Although I am not free from God's law but under the law of Christ to gain those free from the law. To, those we to the weak I became weak in order to gain the weak. I have become all things to all people so that I by all means may save some. I do all these things because of the gospel so that I can participate in it. We're running out of time, so very quickly. Paul said, to the Jews, I act like a Jew. He went to the temple. He still participated in the sacrificial system, which some Christians teach was wrong. It wasn't wrong. It was still appropriate for him. He was still a Jew. I would have to suspect, though, that as a Christian... Paul was doing those sacrifices in memorial rather than anticipation of salvation because he had salvation. But he acted like a Jew. We have record in, in Acts where when a lot of people were beginning to believe that he was no longer teaching things consistent with Judaism, he was told by the council in, uh, in Jerusalem, yeah, maybe a We've got some guys going through their Nazarite vows. Maybe you ought to pay for their sacrifice. Maybe you ought to go and get cleansed with them and go through this, this process so that you can show them that you're still Jewish. But then to the Gentiles, he acted like a Gentile. He didn't offend them with the standoffness that the Jews insisted, that the Pharisees insisted on. When he went into a Gentile's house, he didn't say, no, wash your hands this way, not that way. He didn't say, well, you can't eat that. He didn't do any of that. He acted like a Gentile when he was with the Gentiles. Not in the way that would be dishonoring to God or it would be immoral, but in keeping with God's standards, he put himself in a position where he was accepted by all of the people. And finally, he said, like, I became like the weak. No, he didn't become like weaklings. That's really an under, the idea of the understanding of weak of understanding. To the new Christian who doesn't understand my great theological statements, the super infralapsarianism, he didn't begin to use those statements with them. He used th words, he put himself in their position. One of the greatest things my Uncle Bernie taught me was preach at a level of the audience you have. 
You may know more, but preach at their level so they can understand it. Paul said, I become weak. I become weak in understanding. I downplay my statements so that everyone can understand. That's my quest always. To challenge you, yes, but to make it so you can understand. I think that's what the Apostle Paul is modeling for us. Paul said, look, here's what the gospel message is. Let me explain it to you on a level you can get. We could go into a lot more there. We don't need to. We can move on. Paul was willing to be all things to all men so that he could save some. There is a little bit of a paradox in Paul's statements there. Paul acted as though he was responsible for their salvation. So that he, he acted like he was actually saving them and he was willing to do everything he could to save them. He knew he wasn't the one saving them. He knew that that came from the power of the Holy Spirit. That that was God doing the work. The emphasis here is that Paul was doing everything he could. He did everything God directed him to do to the best of his ability. I don't think there was ever a case that Paul went on sermon .com, sermoncentral.com and downloaded his sermon and preached it. He spent the time and did the work and prepared for them to hear the gospel. That's what Paul is saying, no matter what situation. When he's in the synagogue, he taught the Jews like Jews would understand. When he was not in the synagogue, he taught the Gentiles like the Gentiles would understand. And when he's with people that have no understanding, he taught like that. If he had to use cartoons, he would have used cartoons. So maybe there'll be a cartoon next week. We cannot make, I become all things to all men, a compromise of the gospel. Some people challenge Paul saying he was compromising the gospel. He never compromised the gospel. Ever. If the gospel message offends some, they need to be offended. You know, we have churches all over the place now, uh, seeker-sensitive churches, that don't want to say anything controversial. Don't want to say anything that might possibly offend. If the message of the gospel that the only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone offends someone, they need to be offended. Being all things to all men does not mean that we weaken the message of the gospel. It means we still preach the gospel. We preach it in a way that they can understand it. But Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Anyone offended with that needs to be offended with that. The gospel is offensive. The truth of the word of God is offensive. One of my secret pleasures, well it won't be secret for long, but one of my secret pleasures is when I'm preaching something that's really hard for you to hear, to see you squirm. I love to see you squirm. I love it when God begins working in your heart. And you begin really, ah, I, I don't want to do that. Because I can read on your faces sometimes the ways that you can try figuring out, how can I not do that and still be good? Trust me, your faces say that. <laughs> Paul's life was 100% focused on the ministry of the gospel. He never weakened the gospel ever. If he offended someone too bad, they needed to be offended. We won't read the last so we can get done. We read it earlier, the last part about the, the winner winning the prize, the, the, the runner of the race, struggling, getting prepared to win the race. In the gospel message, there is not a, everybody gets a prize. You know, the deal is, God wants us to work at our best for something. You know, the Corinthians understood the principle of the winner preparing to run the race. There were two primary athletic events in Greece at this time. There were the Olympic Games in Athens, and then there were the Isthmus Games in Corinth. In Corinth. 
These games were absolutely as big or maybe even bigger than the Olympic Games at the time. Mm -hmm. For 10 months before the games, they had to practice. They had to show daily practice reports, write out reports. We did, we did this and this and this and this. And they had to document that through the rules committee. For the last month before the, the games, they had to be in Corinth and they had to be witnessed by the judges. So the people of Corinth were used to seeing them practice. They knew that they had to go through the, the steps <coughs> to, to go through and compete. So that was a perfect illustration for Paul to use. How you have to get prepared to run the race. And then when you run, you don't, I'm going to run today and I'm going to come in fifth. No, I'm going to run today and I'm going to come in first, was what they were all trained to do. You know, in, on the, when the race starts to, this afternoon in Kansas at 2, there will be some guys getting in their car. We call them starting parkers. They, they know they don't have a competitive car, but they know if they start the race, they get X amount of thousands of dollars. And they can live enough on starting the race, making two laps, and parking their car. Starting parkers. That is not a competitive spirit. What do you call a starting parker? A loser! Jesus said, look, run the or Paul said, run the race to be there first. That's how we have to work. That's how he worked. He raced every day to preach the gospel. Not to be the loser. He didn't go into Corinth and say, I got the gospel for you, see ya. No, he, he put himself out there. 12 hours a day making tents so he could preach the gospel. Same is true in our spiritual life. We need to be busy all day, every day, serving Him. Even if we are school teachers, even if we are accountants, or flipping burgers, or selling clothes in a store, or helping other people get jobs, or whatever your job is. No matter what your job is, it is designed for you to be in a place where you meet people that need to know the Lord. That's why God has you there. So you can minister the gospel. So you can do what he wants you to do. Look at verse 27. The last verse. Instead, I subdue my body and make it my slave so that after preaching to others, I myself will not be disqualified. Paul says, I... Subdue my body. That subdue, subdue is literally strike under the eye. The Greek word means literally strike under the eye. I am willing to take the punch, as Paul says, in order to accomplish the message of the gospel. You know, it's not always fun being a Christian. Especially in our economy today. The way in our, in our society today, being a Christian is, you know, that's the last thing that you can now attack. It's perfectly legal for you to discriminate against Christians. Not against Muslims. No, no, no. But Christians, that's okay. If you're a white male Christian, it's even worse. But Paul went through that. He knew that. And he said, I'm willing to take a punch in the eye. I'm willing to go around with black eyes so people know I'm preaching the gospel for God and not for me. From the pulpit... Preachers are always asking people from the congregation to be involved in this or that. We're always saying, hey, you need to get involved in this. I think every pastor should start out their life as minist uh, in ministry as a tent maker pastor, as a bivocational pastor. So he has to put in 40 hours a week at another job before he begins church stuff. So that when he stands up here and says, you need to be involved in this, <clears throat> after you worked your 40 or 50 hours, after you took care of your house, after you did your shopping, and you ran your kids to football and soccer and, all, and ballet and all that kind of stuff, then you might have time to start thinking about doing something for church. But see, the pastor doesn't, doesn't understand that. Most, most of these guys that went on to seminary right from college and then go to their first church, they don't have it. Their 40 hours, if they have a special Sunday night stuff, that's part of their 40 hours. They'll take it off other times. 
See that? We, don't, we, don't, we lose that picture. We need to see what it's like. Paul says, I'm willing to do everything I can. Take that black eye in order to do what God wants us to do in the, in the presentation of the gospel. Remember, God uses your life experiences to prepare you for where you are. He takes you through something so that you're prepared to do something else. He took me through 35 years of public safety to prepare me for today. Now, I was running away, but he used that in his providence to mold me the way he wanted me. As long as we're focused on serving God in whatever capacity he's given us, and we remain focused, focused on winning the race, not parking our car after two laps. We're focused not on just finishing, but on finishing first. We honor him and serve him. We may not finish first, but as long as we're focused on getting there, on doing the very best we can, he's honored and glorified. God has a mission for every one of us. And we always need to be the best that we can be for him. Calling every day on him to guide us and direct us. That's the message that Paul was giving us. I give up everything to serve, he said. I'm even willing to take a punch in the eye in order to serve him. Time's late. Let's pray. Father, you are a great and awesome God. I don't like taking punches in the eye, Father, but you know that, that we're willing to do that if that's what you call us to do. And It appears like our society is going to demand that more from us. So give us the energy, the courage, and the, the durability to be able to stand up to that, to know that you're in control, and that for eternity we'll, we will be yours. You called us to serve you, every one of us, in different capacities, so we trust that we do that properly. We love you and we want to serve you in Jesus' name. Thank you for watching this Sermon on Demand at Friendship Community Church. If this message has been helpful to you in your understanding of the Word of God, please let folks at Friendship Community Church know by sending an email to watching at friendshipcomchurch.org. Thank you again for watching and we look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Community Church.